If you would turn to Galatians chapter 5, if you've got your Bibles, that's where we've been for the last three weeks, and we've got a few more weeks to go here. My title for today is Fruit of the Spirit, Part 4, What the World Needs Now. And that is what? Love what? Sweet love. love. Not just regular. Just, just, Just a fair warning, there's a theme today. So just, just going to put that out there. The, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. All right, so Colossians chapter 3, you don't have to turn there. Just hold your place in Galatians 5. Colossians chapter 3, remember two weeks ago, we were looking at the fruit of the Spirit, but then we looked over in the book of Colossians, which is another letter that Paul wrote to another church, and he gave us almost the exact same list of the fruit of the Spirit, And there was a couple different ones, and they're in different order, but there is one big, very common thing between these two lists. So Colossians 3.14, it says, and over all these virtues, which means the fruit, everything that he just mentioned, over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. It's like love is the binder that holds everything together. It's great to have joy, peace, forbearance, and all of those other fruit, but love is the one main thing that holds everything together. It technically holds all of life together. Um, and we, we cannot have influential relationships with people without this driving force of love behind what we do because if there's no love behind it our relationships are basically just a bunch of rules it's just nonsense spending time with each other and God is all about relationships well speaking of relationships and love um, there was this guy and the true story he wanted to buy a jacket for his girlfriend and so he couldn't decide on which one to get so he asked the salesman he says Hey, if you were buying a jacket for your girlfriend, what kind of jacket would you buy? And the salesman looked at him and said, well, I'd buy a bulletproof jacket because my wife would shoot her. <laughs> you know, relationships are a lot like algebra. You ever looked at your ex and thought, Why? I think my wife just laughed and then said I was ridiculous, (laughs) which she's not wrong. Um, This guy told his girlfriend when she was doing her makeup and she was, she was drawing on her eyebrows and he said, honey, I I think your eyebrows, you you drew them on a little too high. She looked surprised. (laughs) One more. Why not? I mean, we've gone so far down already. (laughs) Why not? All right, so a physics teacher and a biology teacher were dating, but it didn't work out. There was just no chemistry. (laughs) Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. There's nowhere to go from there. You're welcome. Galatians 5, 13. You... My brothers and sisters were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, 
fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So we said our key statement, and we got to keep coming back to this because this is the thing we have to remember. Our key statement for this whole series is, True followers of Jesus will be identified by fruit and sanctification. If you are a Christian follower of Jesus, disciple, however you want to call it, saved, going to heaven, however you want to identify that as, we ought to be able to see fruit and sanctification, which is growth, acting and looking more and more like Jesus. Yes, we have bad days, and yes, we have bad seasons, and yes, but we should be able to look at your life for any amount of time, or people should be able to look at our lives for any amount of time and say, you know what, there is something different about that person. There's no out, there's no different level of Christian, no. It is just the fact that we need to be producing fruit in our lives. John 15, 8 said, this is to my Father's glory, this is kind of our key verse for this whole series, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. <clears throat> and last week we concentrated on verse 17 in Galatians 5, and it was kind of a, a rough message last week. Verse 17 says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. And we said that our flesh is constantly lusting after, was the word, lusting after these evil desires and all of those things that we mentioned. We had four different categories of sin. We had the sensual sins, religious sins, <clears throat> excuse me, interpersonal sins, and social sins. And our flesh is constantly longing for and lusting after those things that are found here, that first list right before the fruit of the Spirit. And I think last week it became a little more personal as I broke them down, didn't it? Like, like at first we read that big list and it's like, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't really do that and I don't do that and I don't even know what that means, so I probably don't do it if I don't know what it means. And, and okay, maybe, yeah, I struggle with a couple of the, maybe the interpersonal sins, but for the most part, I'm good. And then as we really broke them down and really found out what those original words meant, it was like, ooh, yeah, I, I kind of do that and I do that. And so... This flesh, remember, our sarks inside of us is longing for, lusting after doing those things. But we said that there was good news and hope. After that second half of verse 21, it says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that, that should like shake us up big time. But verse 22, but... Such a good word. You need to underline that word in, in your Bible. But it means there is a way out. There is good news. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we have to make a conscious effort and a, a, this, this consistent conscious effort and decision to live by the Spirit. Otherwise, guess what? Guess what you're going to satisfy? Your flesh. Every single time. It's just the natural way of our sin nature. So let's talk about love. All right? 
Verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And again, th this, this list here in the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, the rest of the list, I believe they're kind of in random order. But I don't think it's a coincidence that it starts with love. And of course, when we look back at that Colossians 3 chapter, it says, you know, love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is where it all starts. Now, <clears throat> it's the most important one. It's the crux. It's the foundation. But how do we know that? H how can we really verify the fact that love is the most important of all of them? Well, because Alan Jackson told us so. Anybody tracking with me? After 9-11, Alan Jackson wrote a song where it was called, Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning? And he says this in the chorus, Faith, hope, and love are some good things he gave us. What? But the greatest is love. So we know it because Alan Jackson told us. So, so you may ask, you guys ready for this? You may ask, why is love such a big deal? <clears throat> they say, all you need is love. But what's love got to do, got to do with it? I mean, don't you want to know what love is? That crazy little thing called love? Because, whoa, tainted love. <laughs> Cannot exactly bring me a higher love. Because when a man loves a woman, love is in the air. But nothing compares to when God says, I will always love you. And if you say, I want to know what love is, this is love. That was 11, by the way, in case you were wondering. <laughs> now, the bad news is I have no rest of the sermon because I spent all week putting that together. <laughs> so we can just go to lunch now. I'm just kidding. That took all of like five minutes, so don't be too impressed, okay? So there's four main types of love. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about them because we're really only going to talk about the one. So the first one is the one that we know, agape love. We all, we all know this. It comes from agapao. This is love at the highest level. It's the supreme level of love. And technically, it's, it's God's love for us. And most of the time when Jesus says that we got to love, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That type of love, this is agape love. The biggest, deepest, most meaningful love. The other three are storge, which is just this affection like a familial love. Eros, which is a romantic love. And phileo, which is friendship or brotherly love. And where do we, what do we know about phileo? Is there a city? Philadelphia, right? Which is the city of brotherly love, right? So those are the four main types of love. Um, but if we really want to dig deep and find out what this agape love really is, uh, we should go to a specific chapter in the Bible. What chapter is that? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is known as what? The love chapter. So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, as you're turning there, <clears throat> when do you hear 1 Corinthians 13 read most of the time? In weddings. Now, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, he was not writing this so that we could use it at weddings. Now, it's absolutely fine to use it at weddings. I use it in some weddings sometimes. Um, but this is not specifically speaking about a marriage between a man and a woman. So, here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. <clears throat> Paul says... If I speak in the tongues, or that just means the languages of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, how many in the room here are bilingual? Okay, get a handful here. It's probably 
English and Spanish. I know English and German, right? I know English and Russian, okay? And, and probably some of you guys maybe speak some other uh, languages. That's really awesome. Like, I, I speak enough Spanish to really get me in trouble, okay? I can kind of understand what's going on and kind of not, so I try, and then people look at me like, you are just ridiculous, okay? So, I try. Now, anybody speak more than two languages? Or that you want to actually admit it? Okay, I'm sure some people do. I think some people are being humble. Yeah, over here. Okay, so that's, that's really awesome. Like, it takes a lot. And I know uh, Don and Anita Darcy, they're in the nursery right now, so I can talk about them. Um, they're probably watching. Hey, guys, um, they're, they're watching your kids, too. Don't worry. Um, but they're, they're doing Rosetta Stone learning Spanish right now. That's just really cool. So, like, people that can speak more than one or more than two even languages, that's really cool. Um, tell you a little personal story here. <clears throat> I was in high school, um, and I had a teacher. I had lots of teachers, but I had a teacher. And she, um, it's the best way for me to describe her. She was gorgeous, okay? Or at least 15, 16-year-old me thought so. And she was. She was absolutely beautiful. She also happened to speak five languages. She was my Spanish teacher, and she was from somewhere in, in Europe. I don't know, so she had the accent. She had the hair. She had it going on. But I probably shouldn't talk about it in the church. But she spoke five languages. Like, like I barely speak English well. And to know five languages, that's a really big deal. That is a lot of studying. That is a lot of concentrating. That is a, 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 just a lot throughout your life of just practicing because you can learn a language and then kind of it just slips away if you don't regret it. I do know a handful of words in Creole because when I was a teenager, I worked at McDonald's, but those are not words that we can say in church, okay? <clears throat> I say all that to say this. How cool would it be to speak all of the languages of the earth. Like, I don't even know how many languages. There's hundreds and hundreds of languages, okay? How cool would it be to be able to speak all these languages and all these dialects? I mean, you, you, you roll up to the most isolated little village in the middle of Africa, and they probably never seen a, a white man before, and you roll up there, and in their own you know, language and dialect, you're like, hey, what's up, brothers? How's it going, man? They would be like blown away. That would just be so cool to speak all these languages. And Paul here is saying, <clears throat> if I speak in the tongues, plural, of men, he's saying, if I spoke all languages, and then he just throws in, uh, of men or of angels, which I don't even know what that means, the languages of angels. I'm assuming it's a really big deal. And Paul is saying, how crazy would that be if I spoke every language, I could just go communicate with any person. And Paul was a missionary, so going to different areas and different countries was kind of his thing. He needed to be able to speak different languages. And he said, if I spoke all of these languages but do not have love, I'm just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm worthless noise. That's a really big statement. You guys remember the gong show? That's, I think of that every time I read this verse, but it has nothing to do with the sermon. Verse 2. He gives us another example. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. He says, listen, if, if I can prophesy, like if I'm given a word from God, and I can, like, you know, from God tell what's going to happen in the future, or if I have so much faith that I can move a mountain or do all these miraculous things, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And he doesn't say, I'm just half of a person, or I'm just a fraction of a person. He says, no, I am nothing if I don't have love, even if I could do all of those other things. And he gives one more example. He just keeps taking it a step further and a step further. Verse 3, 
if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now this one right here really is a whole nother level because he's saying if, if I sell everything I have and take every single penny and give it to the poor and then this next line that he says and, he's, and give my body over to hardship, there's, there's two different explanations that I've heard of this. The first one is basically if I sell everything and give everything away and then I also sell myself into slavery and use all of those proceeds, just, just servanthood for the rest of my life and just give all of that away. That's one explanation. But the word actually, the Greek word that's used here is kaio. You know what that means? It means to be burned. So it could also be said, hey, if I sell everything I have and I am burned as a martyr, but I don't have love, <clears throat> I gain nothing. <clears throat> That's a really big deal. That's a really, really big thing. He says, I could give everything away and then give my life. And if I don't have love, it's absolutely worthless. Wow. So, <clears throat> with what we've heard so far, how important do you think love is? You think it's pretty important? You think Paul is just going rogue on this love thing and God really doesn't feel like this way but Paul was just really stuck on love? I don't think so. I think this is exactly how God feels about love because he demonstrated love like this. So then Paul goes on, verse 4. <clears throat> he says, love is patient. And here's the part that we, we always hear. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And we can't leave out verse 13 to honor Alan Jackson here. And it says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Love's a pretty important thing. <clears throat> So here's what I want to do. We're going to take a test. I know everybody's super excited about that. And I want you to give yourself a grade. It can be 1 to 10. It can be pretty good, not so good. I don't know. I'm not going to have you add them all up. We're not going to have a big score at the end. But I've got a huge list of things that I kind of rewrote verses 4 through 7. And I want us to kind of grade or judge ourselves on how good we are at these things. You guys ready? This is going to be so much fun. Here we go. <clears throat> Maybe do it as a 1 to 10. How patient are you? Yeah, just a gut punch right off the bat, huh? How kind are you? How not envious are you? How not boastful are you? How not proud are you? Not dishonoring of others? Not self-seeking? Not easily angered? Not a record keeper of wrongs? Are you someone who loves truth even when it's hard truth? Do you always protect those you love physically, 
mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? Do you always protect those you love? Do you always trust those you love, <clears throat> even when they maybe don't deserve it? Do you always have hope for people, even in hopeless situations? Do you always persevere in love, even when you feel like giving up? And do your actions always reflect love, always? Yes, I threw two always in there. Do your actions always reflect love? How you doing so far? Because this type of love means, and you can... You can give yourself grades on these two. You seek only the best for those around you. That's what this kind of love is. Those who are around you, you are always seeking the best for them. You believe the best about everyone. And just side note, deserve has nothing to do with it. Deserve is not even in this equation. You speak the best about everyone. You have a deep, authentic care for everyone. It's a big one. Do you? You sacrifice yourself for the betterment of others. Is that something you do? Now, I was telling a few people before the service started, they, they asked me about the message, and I, I had to be really honest. Because this one kind of got me. And as I got to about this point in my studying, it kind of clicked, and I went, yeah, I'm not doing so well. Like, like I, I, I don't have this love thing down nearly how I should. So as I was praying through it and it just was, was bothering me, I, I kind of thought, you know what? I need to love better. I need to do better in this. <clears throat> and so I thought, all right, so if I was going to love better, what would I need to stamp on my heart to, to implement love in my life? Like, what would I need to just, just know it inside and out, frontwards, backwards, every which way? What would I need to do? What would I need to get through my thick skull so that I could love better? And so I thought of four things. Four things love is. If you're taking notes, you may want to write these things down. Um, a wise man once said, I may not be a smart man, but I do know what love is. Who said that? Forrest Gump, that's right. I was going to do it in the accent, but I decided not to. I chickened out. Four things love is. And again, these are simple. They're not like I found some obscure hidden passage in the Bible that nobody's read before. This is straight up simplistic cookies on the bottom shelf kind of stuff that we still need to get. Number one, we say this one all the time, love is a verb. Love is a verb. Love is something that you do, not something you have. Love is an action. Verbs, they show action. They show movement. They show something is happening. Noun is a person, place, thing, or an idea. Noun is just something that you have. Oh, I have love. Great. Show me. Show me that love. 1 John 3, 17. And by the way, just a little commercial, the book of 1 John is 
just full of stuff about love. If you're looking to do some extra homework, good on you. You can go read 1 John. It's full of this stuff. But 1 John 3, 17, it says, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Now, living in the USA, you are, I believe it is, in the top 5% of the rest of the world as far as wealth and stuff. Top 5%. And you may say, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I, don't ha- I don't have a... No, top 5% of the world. So guess what? No one gets an out from this verse. So we all have material possessions. And it says, if you see a person that's in need that you can help, this brother or sister that, 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 that needs something and you don't have pity on them, John says... Um, I'm not sure that God's love is actually in you. That is a big, scary, bold statement. What's more effective? Me telling you that I love you or showing you that I love you? Showing every single time. Number one, love is a verb. Number two, Love is a constant mindset. Love is something that we constantly have to have in our minds. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, it says, do everything in love. Everything, every single thing that you do, do it in love. Now, if you look back at that original word, everything, you know what it means? Every thing. No exceptions. You can't hold anger against someone. You can't wrong someone. And honestly, you can't really even sin all that well if love is the most important thing. If you are doing things in love, you can't do those other things because those things have no place in love. <clears throat> Proverbs 3, 3 through 4, it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. It's an absolute, let them never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Love and faithfulness. You get get a bonus one in there, faithfulness. It says, let, 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 them, let them never leave you, like always keep them with you. Bind them around your neck like a, like a chain or a necklace. It's something, this constant reminder that is always there. Do everything in love. And the writer of this proverb makes a promise and says, hey, guess what? If you do that, if you just have love as the driving force, if you never forget about love, you're going to find favor with God and with men, which I would say every single one of us wants both of those things. Love is a constant mindset. Love is a verb. Number three, love is a sacrifice. Love is a sacrifice. In John 15, 12, this is Jesus speaking here. He knew a little bit about love. He says, my command is this. That's not suggestion. That's not recommendation. That's not, I really hope you guys get this. Jesus is commanding us. No exceptions. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Love is a sacrifice. Love is putting others first. Love is seeking opportunity. Shortly after Jesus said this verse, he humbly and willingly went to the cross to demonstrate his love. Yes, he told us 
a lot that he loved us, and I love that. For God so loved the world, but then there was action to show that he gave his one and only son. Love is a sacrifice. So number one, love is a verb. Number two, love is a constant mindset. Number three, love is a sacrifice. Now, this fourth one here kind of came a little bit later as I was as I had the other three developed, and I think, I, I, I was like, I think I'm still missing something. And maybe I was just kind of preaching to the choir, talking to myself a little bit more, but I think number four is important too. Number four, love is a downgrade of yourself. Love is a downgrade of yourself. I, and, and this one kind of echoes constant mindset, sacrifice, but one of my, probably my favorite marital advice that I have, when I, when I talk to people and they're talking about getting married or just really even talking about relationships, my favorite advice is marriage is a race to the back of the line. That's it. If you get that one thing down, obviously put Jesus first. Okay, get that one down. And then the second one is marriage is a race to the back of the line. If you get that down, just downgrading yourself like the other person, everyone else is more important than me. Because, again, just being honest, we're in church, we can be honest here. Guess who my favorite character in my story is? My story of my life, guess who my favorite character is? It's me. It's not you. Sorry. And this is something that every single one of us struggles with. We are our favorite character because kind of everything revolves around us in our lives, doesn't it? And to a certain extent, I, I, I understand how that works. But we have got to constantly set in our minds to downgrade ourselves, lower ourselves, lower our pride to lift others up. In John chapter 13, starting in verse 13, Jesus speaking here, it says, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. Now, this is the last supper that's happening here. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now, pause just for a second. I don't have time, and I would not do a great job of explaining this theologically. That last statement, I can't tell you how big that is. How, how theologically important that statement is, that Jesus had all power and all authority. Now, was Jesus... Since he was born 100% God and 100% man, yes, Jesus was 200%. He was extra. Okay, I get that. But at this moment, all power and all authority had been given to him. And what does he do? Verse 4, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What do you do when you realize you are the most important, most influential person in the room? You leverage that power for the benefit of others. Because that's exactly what Jesus did here. Having all power and all authority from heaven... He took the lowest of jobs. Now, a foot washer back then in that society would have been a, a, a young person, probably a young boy, a servant that was the absolute lowest on the totem pole. 
their feet were absolutely disgusting. They were walking around outside in these dirty, dusty roads with sandals on, so their feet were just caked in dud, uh, mud and dust. Dud, dud, yeah, we'll put both of those together. They had that too. Dust and mud and gross and dirty. And a servant boy would come up when they were to come in and have a meal. When they would enter a house, the servant would come up and wash their feet. And nobody had done that yet in the upper room. And Jesus said, here's an opportunity for me to downgrade myself, to lower myself, to be the servant of all servants for the benefit of everyone else. He took on that position of servant to be a demonstration for us how to live. So four things love is. Love is a verb. Love is a constant mindset. Love is a sacrifice. And love is a downgrade of yourself. And I think these are the things that we need to work on. Because I don't know how to say it any more clear from Scripture of how important love is. Yes, the other fruit of the Spirit, those are very important, but not even in comparison to what love is. We'll close with this verse, John 15, 12. It says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? He gave everything. What's he asking in return? Our hearts. That's what he wants. Jesus wants your heart. Because he gave everything to us. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, thank you that you showed us love how you did. God, we do not deserve your love. We continually mess up. We continually sin against you. We continuously turn our back on you. And you keep on loving us, God. Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends and God, you sent your son Jesus to lay his life down, not to have it taken from him, but to lay it down sacrificially for us. Thank you for that love. God, help us to love better. God, as Christians, it's really easy to judge, it's really easy to condemn. But God, help our driving force of everything that we do out in this world to be love. God, help us to have love on display at all times. Help us to do everything in love, as your word says. Again, thank you that you displayed that love to us and your son, Jesus. God, if there are any here this morning who do not know you as their personal Savior, right now in this moment, would they say, Jesus, I need you. I want that love that we're talking about. God, right now in this moment, if they do not know you as their Savior, God, work in their heart. May they call out to you. And God, for us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, for those of us who have been getting this love thing wrong, help us, God. Help us to love better. Help us not to just convince a dying world of heaven, but help us to show your love and show them that there is a God who loves them 
enough to give his son. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, use it in an awesome way. God, help us to be generous people. Help us to make a difference in this world. We love you, Jesus, in holy name.